Okay, thanks everybody for coming to our webinar on the new template, Template B 2.0 uh, information session. Um, I'm your host, Patrick LeClaire. I'm a data specialist here with the Gordon Foundation, I'm joining you from Chibuktuk here in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, and some of you may also know it as Halifax, Nova Scotia. So to start off, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on the Gordon Foundation. Gordon Foundation is a 55 year old charitable organization based out of Toronto, Ontario. We have two main programs. One is our Northern program, which works with uh, Canada's North, and the other is our water program, whose flagship initiative is DataStream, an online hub for sharing water quality data, uh, which I believe is why you guys are all here today. So we started DataStream in 2016 with McKinsey DataStream and have since expanded into the Atlantic region in 2018 and Lake Winnipeg in 2019. So quick overview of what we're gonna talk about here today. Um, we're just going to go over why the version jumped to 2.0 and not to 1.8, as the last version was 1.7. Uh, we're going to talk about the reason for these changes, uh, go over schema changes, which is changes to the actual, you know, allowed values and columns, template changes, so actual templates, changes to physical upload template. Then we'll do a quick demo and open it up for questions. So why version 2.0? Um, so one of the big reasons uh, for doing a major change, which is the change in that first number, uh, is because we did have uh, these major breaking changes to both the schema and the template. So these were really big changes and we wanted to make sure that everybody, you know, could clearly see that uh, with the version number. We also were taking the template in a totally new direction. Um, and we wanted to make sure that people were aware of this and downloading the new template as this new template is going to be a lot easier. But also if you use the old template and uh, format your data with the old template, it actually won't upload and you'll get errors. So the reason for the version change was just a clear distinction between the new templates. On DataStream, you'll notice we do a, a version uh, format where the first number is a major version and the second number is a minor. Minor changes are just you know little modifications or bug fixes. Major versions are when we do something where we just totally rehaul the whole system. So that's why we went to version 2.0. So why did we make these changes? So one of the biggest reasons we did, um, and one of the biggest reasons we do most of the things here at DataStream is feedback from users. So we really love getting feedback from people. Um, so if you have any, please like feel free to send us emails and let us know. We do take it and we do um, you know, try to take that feedback, synthesize it and make changes. So what we heard from users was that the upload process was too time consuming, arduous, uh, and they wanted some way to make it quicker and more streamlined. So to do that, we modified the template because that's the way that people upload to data stream and tried to make that an easier process and decrease the amount of data entry that needed to be done. Another reason was that the WQX, so the water quality exchange uh, out of the US, which is kind of our parent model that we've based the data stream data model off of, they released a brand new version, version 3.0. So they had a breaking version so we wanted to incorporate some of those changes. So we also um, bumped our uh, schema up a version and therefore that kind of affected our template as well. Finally, we added some new data types. So this was a really big um, thing is we you know, had always just done surface water and uh, we've been getting lots of requests from people for a number of different data types. Um, we don't have all of the ones that people want and we know that, you know, people will be sitting at home going, oh, what are these new data types? Maybe it's the ones I'm looking for. They may not be there, but you know, we're slowly always growing and adding, um, but we wanna make sure whenever we add a new data type that we have some kind of, that it, you know, um, we have the last data type really kind of fleshed out and, and solidified because we don't wanna get you know, beyond our means, right? We wanna make sure that we're doing one thing and doing it really well, um, but we found that we could add a new data type uh, and I'll explain what that one is. Uh, and then finally, uh, preparation for new t features and data stream growth. So data streams really growing. Um, we've got lots of new users on all the time. We're releasing a ton of new features. Uh, in the next year, you're gonna really notice some big changes to data stream. And we wanted to make sure that we um, had things in the template to make sure when those changes happen, we were prepared for them. So with that being said, I'm just gonna get into what these changes look like. So first we're gonna talk about the schema changes. What I mean by this is this is changes to things like allowed values and columns that are required. Uh, so we'll start with activity media name. So this is where the new data type comes in. So before our data type was only surface water. So you could only put uh, surface fresh, you know, surface water into data stream. 
Um, we've heard though from a lot of people that they really wanted sediment data. We have people who are collecting it in kind of um, in joint, you know, you're going out, you're doing your surface water and you take a soil or sediment sample at the same time. So we looked into it and found this was really easy to change. All we needed to do was add this new media name. So we've since done that. So now when you're going through data stream and you choose your um, media type or media name, you can now choose either surface water sediment. So that's for any um, sample that would be taken from kind of the top of uh, the bottom. If you look at a lake or a river or a pond, if you're taking that kind of top layer of sediment and sampling that, that's what you would get there. The other is subsurface soil. So that's if you're actually taking like a soil core, taking that out and then doing soil analysis on that. Um, and then we've also, in addition to that, uh, have more granular data types now. So before, again, we only had surface water and surface water incorporated basically everything. And, and that led to some kind of errors a bit where we were putting things like temperature, air and precipitation under surface water because that was the only thing we had. Um, we also were putting marine data under surface water, which, you know, there is a big difference when you're looking at um, comparing guidelines and, and comparing two different values. So what we've done uh, is we've added some new data types. So we added ambient air. So that'll be for uh, the climate, uh, climatological data that people are adding. Uh, pore water. So that's if you're taking a soil sample, um, you're removing the water from that soil core and sampling that. And then the last of the ocean water. So that's any kind of salty or marine data. Um, we've also changed some of the uh, required and conditional columns. So in data stream, for those of you that don't know, um, we have some columns that are required, some that are conditional and some that are optional. Um, the reason for this is we wanna make sure we have all the robust metadata that we need and that other people need to be able to reuse your data. So the two new required columns we've added, one is result value type. So what result value type does is it, the main reason it's there is to differentiate between calculated and actual values or estimated values if you're kind of doing a, a close estimate. Um, so that's required for all um, values now. We also have required monitoring location ID. So before you could just use the name um, to differentiate between your different uh, coordinates, we've added the ID as a mandatory section now um, because it does, uh, is kind of a better differentiator for uniqueness. Um, and we've seen some people, you know, maybe want to use the same name, but have different sites in one location. So we've done the monitoring location ID now as a required column. Uh, in addition to that, we've added some new conditional columns. So one is method speciation. So again, with data stream, um, when you put in a uh, characteristic, uh, some of those characteristics up to this point have had result sample fraction be mandatory. So that's whether it's total or dissolved or filtered or unfiltered. Um, we've also added now method speciation. So that's, uh, you know, is it as nitrate uh, or is it as nitrogen, as phosphate, as phosphorus? Uh, this is from, this uh, conditionality is, got, is uh, derived directly from the US EPA's requirements for their WQX model. Um, so again, it's just to help with, uh, you know, reducing ambiguity in data. Uh, so some conditional columns, we've got other ones, uh, analytical method ID and context or name is required for all lab data. So that's why it's conditional on an activity type. So if you're using lab data, which in our case, we put in a sample routine, it's a routine sample, you need to either have the method ID in context. So that would be a US, a US EPA 200.8, it's a pretty common one, or it could be VMV values or SM or AFA. Those are kind of the main ones we see, or it could be the name. So it could be that you used um, ICP, MS is like a pretty common one. So that information you may not know, um, you just have to get that from your lab um, and then you can add it in there. Uh, finally, we also require if you do have lab data to add the laboratory name. Um, this is so that people can track back and, and contact the lab to get more confirmation on uh, sample procedures uh, if they need them. And finally, uh, the result condition limit measure unit and type. So before, we have above and below, which is your classic, you know, greater than or less than symbol. Instead of having that in with the result value, we break it out and have a separate column for it. Um, now we have uh, detected, not quantified and not detected. And those are presence absence. So if those exist, you don't have a measure or a unit because it's just presence absence. So it, it's not above or below anything. It's just, is it there or is it not there? I'll show you what all of these are like when we get to the demo and that should explain things a bit better. Some other miscellaneous ones, um, we removed monitoring location water body. 
one of the reasons for this is that it was used pretty sporadically. People weren't using it. Um, you know, not everybody was using it. It was an optional column, which we found some people were and some people weren't, um, which made the filtering by it not super helpful. Our goal is uh, moving forward is to actually do that uh, programmatically. So in the database, we'll assign those water bodies based on the location. So it'll be preset and that's not something the user will have to do. Um, we also added more val allowed values to better align with WQX. So they moved to version three. We also um, wanted to align with that. So we added some new values and we also added duplicate checking now. So we also found with some data sets, we're actually getting a lot of duplicate values, which what we consider duplicate is if every single row is the same. So if you're uploading data and every single row is the same for two um, entries, we're going to remove that from, the, from your data on upload. So we did add a check for that on the results tab of the template, I'll show you that. But again, we remove these on upload. So when you upload data, if there are duplicate, total duplicate rows, they will be removed. So template changes. So what did we actually do to change the template from the first version to this version? So we added a bunch of new additional tabs. Um, Counterintuitively, by adding more tabs, we've made it actually easier. Um, it's, uh, you know, normally you think adding more tabs would make it more work. It does make it, the template a bit bigger, but when we see it, you'll see how much more streamlined it is. So one of the tabs is the data set metadata tab. So what we've done is in the old template, all of the columns existed on one tab. So you had 32, I think it is, columns all on one sheet. And it was really overwhelming. What we've done is we've broken them up into their different sections. And now for uh, data for these three tabs, you only need to input that data the first time you use the template. And then from there, we'll just keep you copying that information over. And again, we'll, you'll see it um, better when we actually go into the example. But the metadata data set tab stores your data set level metadata and it populates the data set name in your final results. The monitoring location stores the um, unique location information for each of your unique locations. And then it uses that monitoring location ID to match it. That's another reason why it's required now. And finally, the characteristic metadata tab stores the characteristic information for each of your unique characteristics and it uses an ID to match that over to your results. We also added a results tab. So this is where when you go in each time to add data, you're only going to add information on this results tab. Um, and this is where you put in your unique uh, observations. Um, and this is where also it'll let you know if there's duplicates. Uh, finally, the export tab. So this is when you go to the export tab, you click a re this refresh button. I'll show you where how to do that. And it'll join all of the data from the other previous four tabs into one sheet that you then save as a CSV and then upload to DataStream. And finally, uh, we added a tips and tricks tab for troubleshooting advice uh, for common errors and just some uh, tips. We also updated the instructions. So the instructions just changed to update the new process. Um, and we've added new instructions that are different for Mac and PC users. So unfortunately, the feature we use to combine the four tabs into one is only available on PCs. Um, there is plans for it to be released on Mac and it's currently in beta testing, but it has been released. So Mac users will just have to copy and paste it over. It should still make the process easier, however, or at the very least, the same amount of effort. Uh, we also use Excel tables now. So if any of you are familiar with Excel tables and how they work, it just means that as you add your data, the tables will actually grow and it's used to cross-reference the data so we can bring it all together. Um, so this helped keep the size of the template down um, and will really reduce, yeah, how much when you save it each time, how much uh, space it's going to take and will hopefully make it load faster. So with that being said, I'm going to jump into a quick demo here to show you guys what the new templates going will look like. Okay, awesome. So uh, here is the new upload template. Um, as you can see from the uh, front page here, uh, this is the instructions um, from the tab down at the bottom. Um, the instructions basically just runs you through how to do the upload. A couple of things to note though. Um, one is compatibility. Uh, take a quick look here to make sure that your uh, Excel version and your computer uh, are able to run this. If you are running a version of Excel that's from uh, 2010 or 2013, 
um, you need to download actually the Power Query add-on. It's through uh, Microsoft. It's quick and easy to download. Just click there and download it. Um, you can also uh, check your version. It'll run you through how to check your version here. Uh, I won't go through all of the instructions because uh, we'll kind of go through that as we go. But I do recommend, you know, when you do it for your first time, taking a look through because there is some good tips there uh, and it'll walk you through step by step. One of the big things here is this allowed values tab. Um, it hasn't changed from the last version, but since we do have some new people here, I'll just kind of go through a quick overview of what this is. This is basically, this is the main kind of meat and potatoes of the data model. It tells you all of the columns, uh, which ones are required uh, or optional or conditional, and then also what your allowed values are. So here, for example, um, we've added that look, monitoring location ID is now required. Uh, your coordinates have to be in decimal degrees. Um, it also, we've added uh, some new media names. So before, like I said, we just had surface water. Now we've added these other five. Um, lets you know, you know, your date and time formats, what they have to be in, as well as your characteristic names, you, you know, what the names have to be in. We want to make sure everybody's putting their names in the same, makes it way easier for cross comparison. Um, as well, like I said, method speciation is now conditional. If you're looking at which characteristics require a method speciation, uh, you can check that out on tab 10 here, which is characteristic name lookup. You'll notice now on this tab, this method speciation uh, has a no. If it has a yes, then it's required. Same with sample fraction. Something we've also added to are the cast numbers. So for those of you that aren't familiar with cast numbers, um, they're kind of a standardized numbering system for different parameters. So this can be helpful if you're trying to find a match for names. Um, a lot of parameters have very different names for the same thing. If you can get this cast number from your lab, they should be able, you should be able to look it up here to compare them. Um, yeah, so the allowed values tab, check it out. It's got kind of all of which columns are required. We've also changed the colors um, up at the top to match the colors of the new tabs. So for example, modern locations is blue. So it's blue up here. Uh, results is this green color. Uh, if it's dark, uh, it's so characteristic name, it's this dark brown means it's required, the light means it's optional. So that's another way too, to quickly tell if it's required or optional. Since we also have uh, changed things around a little bit and added new columns, um, we also modified the glossary here. So the glossary tab just breaks down each of the columns, which section they're in and what their um, definitions are. Um, in addition to that, we also have uh, different uh, definitions for some of the allowed values as well. So you can kind of make sure that you're putting in the correct allowed value for what you're trying to express. This includes um, definitions for the new activity media names as well. So you can make sure you're putting in the right ones. So with that being said, I'm going to get into kind of the example and demo of actually using the template. So this is where we start inputting our data. So this is the data set metadata tab. So like I said, this is for data set level metadata. So this will is a companion piece to your data. Uh, it lets people know who collected the data, who to contact, um, and how the data was collected. So you'll see that some of them are red um, and some are yellow. Um, so the red is required, yellow is optional. Uh, there's also green. So the green one just is saying, you can add your own citation, but if not, we'll auto-generate that for you. So the main thing you need to make sure you have in here is this data set name. Um, so what this is going to do is it's going to draw from this and actually use it to populate your data. So make sure that this is filled in. Um, but the other stuff, you will eventually copy and paste this into the data stream site. Uh, so this is just a, a place to store it. Some of you may have also done this with the Word document, the metadata form Word document, that's also totally fine as well. We just thought throwing it in here um, would be helpful because it's another place and it's all kind of in one space. So you can just fill in all your information here. Um, I won't go through all of those columns. We haven't really um, made any changes there. Um, and once that's all filled in, then we go over to our monitoring locations. So this is where we put in each of our unique monitoring locations. So that's a key thing here is they have to be, you know, each of these have to be unique locations. Um, we don't, this is to help minimize the work, right? Before uh, in the old template, each line, you'd have to repeat the same location over and over. What we found was happening sometimes is locations with numbers, people were clicking and dragging, and it was just adding one each time. 
Um, same with latitude and longitude, and, and we are getting a bunch of errors there. This is hopefully going to prevent that. So I'm going to give you guys an example sheet. So this is an example um, results sheet from a lab. Uh, we've got our coordinates here. So, uh, so yeah, so latitude and longitude. So we're going to copy those over. So I'm just going to copy those over to our Excel uh, template. One thing I'd also recommend um, when you're copying and pasting in Excel is if you just go copy and paste. So if I just come over here, copy that, go to the template, and then just right click and hit just regular paste or hit control V. Um, what can happen is you'll notice, uh, what can happen is what it can do sometimes is copy over the old formatting and delete the formatting here. What I recommend is right clicking and clicking on this one with the one, two, three, which is values. It'll just make sure that only the values are copied over and not the actual information. You'll also notice here that we've got um, this one turned green, which means it's correct. This one, however, is red. Um, the reason for that is, as we can see, uh, has to be between zero and 90 degrees. We've got negative, so we need to uh, delete that one because it's a longitude. Uh, one of the reasons for this is we've added this because we were noticing um, people putting data points. I logged in one day, and, and a lot, we had a lot of data in Kazakhstan. I don't think a lot of people using Atlantic data stream live in Kazakhstan and sample there. Um, it was just a missing uh, coordinate. So we added that in to make sure there would be no mistakes. So I copy my latitude and longitude for my site. Uh, in this case, I don't actually have a site name. So I'm just going to make one up. So let's say my location ID is one. And my site, let's call it site one. Um, and then I can add this for my other ones. So let's do. Say two. Uh, I'm just using that uh, other feature there just to uh, so that it'll go sideways. So let's go two, site two, and then maybe I'll do just do a third one here. Go. Oh. Okay, and then site three. Okay, awesome. So this only has to be done, like I said, once. So the first time that you come and you put your data in, you'll just do this the first time and that's it. And again, so this prevents repetition. So you'll just add your um, coordinate reference system. So I'm just gonna use the same one for all of them. And then location type. So let's say this one is an estuary. Uh, let's say this one actually is a lake. And then let's say these two are streams. OK, so now I've got my locations. These are my three unique locations. They're put in here, and I've only done it once. If I do repeat it, so let's say I do uh, add another duplicate one, um, it actually will turn red here to note that I've got duplicates on these guys. Also, if I go to put in um, another ID that already exists, so if I go to put three in again, it's going to kick me back and say it must be unique. So I delete that, and we've got a unique location IDs now. OK, so locations inputted, ready to go. So next, we go over to our characteristics. So as you can see in characteristics, modern locations was all red because they're all mandatory. Here we have some that are mandatory that are in red and some that are optional in yellow. So characteristic ID, I've gotten a lot of questions about this. This can be anything. So characteristic ID can be numbers. It can be um, an internal key that you guys use uh, for the characteristic name, some combination. It just has to be unique for each parameter. So one of the ways I think is kind of handy with this is if you actually use it as a key. Um, so let's say this lab data that I get, if I actually use that as my ID, it'll make the process a lot easier. And I'll show you that here in a second. So I'm going to paste those in. As you notice, um, when I pasted it in, it extended past the, the length of the table, and then the table just um, expanded to match it. Uh, and then I'm going to do some physical parameters, because in this case, I'm going to pretend that those are from the field. OK, awesome. So I've got my parameters. Everything's inputted. So now I'm going to start filling in my columns. So activity type, so these ones are all lab samples. So copy in my lab samples. 
And then these ones here are field samples. So let's say there's a field portable logger. Let's say I used a YSI to collect them. So what you'll notice now is once I have inputted my activity types, if I scroll over here to the right, I've got these new columns that have turned to red. So these are my laboratory name and my method name columns. So these are now mandatory. Um, like I said, this is new. We um, had requests from you know, a lot of researchers and people want to reuse the data that this is really important. So we added those as mandatory, but it's not required for the field parameters because obviously there's no lab that the data was sent to. So in this case, my activity media name, um, I'm just going to go with surface water across the board just because they're all um, surface water. Sample collection equipment. Um, this is optional, but normally it's you know it's a water bottle for uh, lab data, and then it is a um, probe sensor if you're do using a YSI or hobo logger or something in the field. Okay. So next, I need to put in the characteristic name that uh, data stream allows for each of these. So one way I can do that is if I double click in the box and start typing, so let's say alkalinity, if I type it in and then press the drop down, it's actually going to give me a short list of all the ones there. So this is alkalinity total. Easy. So I'll do the same thing here. Ammonia, click the drop down. I see, oh, ammonia is there. So I'm just going to add the rest of these in um, just because. Uh, I know what they are. Again, you'll only have to do this once. So the first time you use the template, you'll add all these in. Um, but every other time, you'll just reopen the template, and these will already be included. So now you'll also notice that as I put these in, um, these uh, method speciation and result sample fraction will turn from yellow to red. So what that is letting you know is which ones um, actually have those two columns required. So um, this is just pulling it from um, pulling it from that other one and just and just denoting it. So if it is red, you're going to need to get that information. That's something that your lab uh, will be able to provide for you. Um, and then sulfate. And if you put in the wrong one, as you saw I did there with temperature, um, that'll also change to red and let you know it's wrong. So change that, temperature water. Awesome, now we're good to go. So I'll throw in my method speciations. So um, if we look here, we've got as N. Alkalinity It's not required, but if you want, you can throw it in because you have that information. Just because something is optional doesn't mean you can't have it. Um, it just means that you don't have to. So um, we've also got these are all have all been denoted as n. So as n, as n, as as n. Um, now, unfortunately, phosphorus they didn't let us know. I'm going to assume it's as p as phosphorus, but that's something you'd have to check. And then result sample fraction. So unfortunately, um, not all of the result sample fraction information was included. So we'll have to go back and ask our lab about that. Uh, one thing also to note is for nutrients, so ammonia and phosphorus here, they both have total. Um, we actually leave total and dissolved for um, non-nutrients. For nutrients, we want to know if it's been filtered or not. The reason for that is that to phosphorus dash total, it's hard to know if that's total as in it was unfiltered or total as in all speciations of phosphorus. So um, for these nutrients, I'm going to want to put um, the, whether it was filtered or not. However, for the other ones, I'll put, I'm going to assume it's total in this case. Um, you'd have to ask your lab to get that information. And I'm going to assume that all of these have been unfiltered. Let's call this, let's throw a dissolved in there just for fun. Okay, cool. Next, we want to put in our units. So in this case, um, the units I can get all from my data. Pretty straightforward. So copy those here, paste in here, um, and then the same with my field ones. 
So what you notice is as I copy and pasted these in, um, some of them were good, awesome. Some of them turned to red, so I need to change those. So for pH, we actually just use none. Uh, and then for degrees Celsius, we just put DEGC. Uh, one thing, uh, you can look those up uh, on tab 11, which is the result unit lookup tab. So you can look it up there. Um, okay, so I've got my units in. Result value type, so that's actual um, for almost all of them. However, we can see here from total dissolved solids that that's actually a calculated value. So put that in here to denote the calculation. Um, if any of them have greater than or less than, so in this case, we actually know that information ahead of time. So we know our limits, so we can copy those over. So put in our quantitation limits, so we copy those in. Uh, and then these turn red because now they've become mandatory. So we need to copy over our units. So I'll copy the units in here. These aren't required because there's no measure. And then our limit type. So this is something you may have to ask your lab for as well. The two main ones are lower reporting limit or method detection limit. Oops. So um, the definitions are in the uh, glossary. So you can just send those to your lab and ask them which one's which. In this case, I'm just going to assume it's all low reporting. So let's throw those in. Again, this step, um, you know, you used to have to do this every single time. This you only have to do once at the very first time you do it. And then you just keep going from there and using that same information. So the last step here is in terms of the, um, the, uh, sorry, the analytical methods. So if I copy these analytical methods over into the template, so I'm gonna copy them, let's just copy them here. Um, so I don't have it for all of them, so I'd actually have to go back to my lab and ask, but um, we'll notice this is kind of, we've got the AFA here. So this is actually what's going to be our context. So there's a drop down here, you'll see that AFA exists. So click on AFA. So, um, in this case, actually, most of them are alpha values. They're all alpha values. Um, however, I think also in this data set, oh no, they're all alpha in this data set. Sometimes you'll see other ones though. Sometimes you'll see um, US EPA uh, is another very common one or standard method, which is SM. But these are the names. So, okay, I'm gonna copy these names over as well. So I'll put my names in here. So you'll notice names became optional. I don't need them, but I have them. So why not throw them in? Um, so we'll copy AF all the way down. These also, I don't think are all the correct methods across. I'm just copying and pasting it in. You're gonna wanna make sure just to check to make sure your methods are correct. And I'm just gonna remove this AF part at the beginning because that's denoted in our context. So yeah, some of these are definitely didn't match up, but this isn't actually luckily my data that I'm submitting anywhere. This is just a test for you guys to see, so. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and then uh, and then what I'm going to do here is calculation. I'm actually going to, uh, since there is no ID, I'm actually just going to put calculated or calculation. You can do that too in the method name. And then next, I'm going to put my lab. So I'll just put lab because, um, and then copy those in. And then there we go. So that's the end of how, and then I just need to get this other information, but that's how we would put all of our parameters in. And again, you only do this once. Um, I'm going to answer a question here that we got. Uh, is there a way to have the same parameter done by multiple labs in which they do something differently? Absolutely. You can also have the same one within the same lab if they do something differently. So let's say they do, you get the same thing sampled twice, one with milligrams and one with nanograms. To do that, um, you just need to make sure the characteristic ID is unique. So let's take, I'm just gonna do a quick example. Let's say this alkalinity one. So I wanna throw alkalinity in here. I'll copy it down. Um, the issue here is that, you know, we have the same ID twice. It's gonna tell me that that's an error. So what I could do here is I could say that this is milligrams per liter. Let's just say the unit changed. And then I could add at the end of this one, nanograms per liter. 
And then I would just change maybe this one to nanograms per liter. Um, another example could be if I have the same parameter, but maybe two different labs. So I could call um, this one maybe dash lab one. And then maybe I have to paste this down here and call this uh, lab two. Um, and then I could just change my lab. So this would be lab one, and this would be lab two. So you can change them up as much as you want. Just the, the characteristic name can be repeated multiple times. You just need to make sure that you have a unique ID that differentiates between each one of those, um, those lab types and lab ones you get. Um, so yeah, I hope that answered the question. Uh, if you need a follow up, you can, you know, ask again, or uh, you can also reach out afterwards if that didn't fully answer your question. So okay, so now I've got all my metadata for my characteristics and my monitoring locations done. So I save that, and this is what I go back to each time. Now what I do is I just need to put in my results. Um, okay, so now I go to my results tab. So uh, we're going to go to our data. Okay, so first thing we want to look at is our um, monitoring location ID. So let's start and let's just say I want to do all of my results for location one. So next thing, my characteristic IDs. So I said, like I said, characteristic IDs, we're just going to use these, we used these numbers. So I can do that. These, not numbers, these uh, values. So I inputted those in. You'll notice this one went red because it doesn't exist. That's because over here, I, I changed it. So I'm just gonna change that back. Cool, that's good now. And these are all for location one. So I've got my location. Next, I just need to put in my date. So date, I can copy my date over. Uh, date can be a tricky one. Like I said, you really need to, it, you need to make sure it's in the format. We have some tips and tricks on how to get your dates if you are running into issues. Uh, I'm going to copy over my um, time. You'll notice though, however, it did change the format. Uh, a quick tip on that is uh, Excel likes to auto to your format that you have your computer set at. If you're not super partial to any format, I recommend changing it to the year, month, day. That's what data streams in and it'll make sure that your dates go into the right format automatically. Um, okay, next thing I do, final step here is I just copy over my results. So I'm just gonna copy my results in. Okay, oops. Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna copy my results. So those have been copied in. You'll notice, however, that this one is red. That's because I've got that less than symbol in there. So I'm just gonna remove that. Um, and then we're gonna change this to uh, below detection limit because it was already below. And it's for ammonia. So if I go back to ammonia, we can see ammonia was 0 0.05 and that's what it was below. So that's how it'll match it. Um, so from there, I can add result status ID. This is if it's uh, accepted uh, or rejected. If you've looked at it or not, those are optional. You can also add any comments you want. Um, you can add the uh, start date of the analysis. So if you do have the date, it was analyzed. So uh, in this case, we do. So I'm gonna take, you know, I can take the day it was analyzed. I can throw that into my data. Um, so I can paste that in. We go. Um, and then I was also given the time, so I can take the time and paste that in as well. So the time's up here. Um, now my time's in. You'll notice also the time zone changed. So for the lab, you actually have to include the time zone. The reason for this is with the result, we auto do the time zone because we know where the, the um, locate the date, the 
where the uh, point is, but the lab, we may not know. So your lab actually may be in a different time zone than where you're at. So you just need to make sure that you include the time zone if you're going to include the time, because um, some people send their labs into other time zones. And then the lab ID. So in this case, we've got our lab ID, which is this guy here. OK, perfect. So I've got all my information from a results picked in. You notice that this duplicate tab. Uh, so the duplicate tab will let you know if you have duplicates or not. Um, so if I do, let's say, duplicate an entire column, so let's a uh, row, sorry, let's duplicate this row. Uh, you'll notice they both turned all red. And if I go over the duplicates is red, so I'm, I can now need to delete this. Um, so I'm just going to do one more quick just through um, showing some other, um, just to show you what it could look like for one parameter for multiple locations. So. Um, I think I only did the first two locations. I'm just going to throw those in. So if I wanted to throw these other two locations in, um, I could do this and this. So I've got my two locations. I don't know why I copy and pasted these. I probably could have just written two and three. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, and then let's say we just want to continue with alkalinity. Uh, for both of these. So then I just come over here and I'd grab, for alkalinity, I would grab two and three. Transpose them and then put them in there. And then copy that down. I'm not going to go through the other ones, just be like the other the lab IDs and stuff, just because that's pretty straightforward. But that's just how you would do it for multiple locations. Um, so that's this whole one. Again, this is the one you're going to be doing each and every time. If it's only YSI data, you may only actually need to do one, two, three, four, five columns of, of inputting. So it's not a whole lot. It's way less columns each time. Before, again, you, may, you would have to have done about 12. Now each time you only have to do five. So it really decreases it. Before I go on though, I did get another question here. Is it standard time or does it account for daylight savings? Yeah, so you're gonna put it as the local time uh, at that day and at that location uh, that you recorded. Uh, and then we do all of the conversions and stuff on our own end um, for people who are accessing the data. So you don't actually have to worry about messing around with the dates, just record it as the day um, and time that it was at that day and time. Okay, so now I've got uh, so go back, we've got our modern locations, three of those filled in. We've got a characteristic metadata, um, you know, one of the bigger tabs with the most unknowns you have to go to your labs about, but that's all filled in now, only did that once. And I did my results for this time. So the final step, I go to export and I right click. So I click up here on the, the headers, right click, you'll see it says refresh, I hit the refresh button. And now what it did is it joined all of those four tables into one. And we're good to go. What it also does is it also um, will order them. So it orders them by uh, day and time. Um, so you'll notice there's no day and time here. That's kind of why it goes first. And then it'll also order them by, so date, time, characteristic name, uh, and then location name, I think is the exact order there. Um, the reason for the ordering is that actually saves time and makes the upload faster because we were ordering it on upload. So it orders it all. You can go through and you can see which information you're missing and go back and change that. Um, and then once this is here, so you click that right click, you hit refresh. You're just gonna go to file, save as. Um, I'm just gonna save it to my desktop. So let's just save this as a session upload, session test data. So make sure when you come in, Make sure you click uh, CSV. Uh, don't if you click uh, some of these other ones like CSV DOS, CSV Macintosh, or uh, they may have deleted it. There was another one that said like, C oh, this one here, CSV UTF-8. Don't click any of those because they can cause formatting issues. Just click the regular CSV comma, um, hit save. Uh, okay, can't be saved as multiple sheets. That's fine. So um, now when I re-upload this, it'll just be in my CSV file. Then I just go to uh, the data stream site. So, 
So once that's all been saved, I go to data stream, I log into my account. And then I either, if it's, uh, if it's data that I'm adding to a data set, I just click on my existing data set and then go to um, update data and go to add new data. Um, that's all in the upload guide, which is on the resources page. We also have some videos for that on our YouTube channel. Or if I'm adding a new data set, I just go down, go to add new data set, agree to terms, and then I just uh, either drag and drop it in, or you can click here, go to your desktop, add it. Now I'm gonna get some errors kicked back. So you'll see these errors that got kicked back. Those were the ones that were read um, when I saved it. Uh, there's different reasons. I just didn't include the date. I didn't go all the way down. Um, lab names and IDs, I just didn't go through that whole process. But it will give you um, the, the errors you received and then also the rows that those affected. So now I can go back to my data, open it up. I can see where my mistakes were. So I can see the red ones. I can make those changes, resave it. And then when I upload it, it should upload fine. Um, if not, if there's other additional errors, it'll let me know what those are. Um, so with that being said, um, that's all we have for the upload session. Uh, just a couple things I wanted to bring up. Uh, one is our, uh, for those of you that don't know, we are putting on some, um, we have been putting on some webinars so far this year uh, as part of our dive into data webinar series. Uh, everything from Excel tips and tricks uh, uh, and man data management practices. We also have a data stream online training. It's based around the old template, but it does kind of walk you through the whole process of getting your data on data stream. Um, and we also have this one coming up uh, on November 26th that Mary will be doing along with one of our advisors, Megan Thompson. And that's on uh, quality assurance and quality control for your data. Um, if you want to register, you can go to datastream.org backslash webinars and register there. Uh, if you do want to check out though, one of the past webinars, um, you can just go down here to view the recording and it's going to take you to our YouTube channel. Um, so this will take you directly to that recording. But if you go to our YouTube channel, um, you can also check out a number of other videos that we currently have up here. So we have all our dive into data. We also do a, every month at the beginning, first Wednesday of the month, we do an office hours. We record that. Uh, it's just a quick couple minutes snippet on what updates we have. Um, so yeah, I recommend coming out here and checking out some of these uh, videos that we've done in the past, if you're looking to learn more. Um, you can also get the newest template from our resources tab on our uh, on any of the hubs, whichever hub you um, are acquainted with. Uh, and that'll give you the most up-to-date version here. So um, yeah, it'll tell you which version is, is the current one and then you can download the templates from here and as well as the upload guide for how to upload to DataStream. Uh, so with that being said, um, I'm gonna open it up for any final questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, I've got a few as we went along, but um, I don't see any right now. If people do have questions and or if they, as they get going, have more questions, please reach out. Um, if you do run into any issues as you're using the template, let us know. Um, since this is a new template, we have had you know a couple bugs that have slipped through and we've made some changes. Uh, so if you are running into an issue and you're you know thinking, I've been doing the right thing. Like this is what they told us to do. Why isn't this working? Send us a message and we'll look into it. It could be a bug and we'll make sure to get that fixed and updated. Um, since again, the old template, we went through eight versions. We had lots of time to iterate and fix. Uh, this is a newer one. So we're still working out some of the kinks. So that being said, thank you guys for coming to today's session. Uh, check us out at datastream.org. Uh, follow us on Twitter or Facebook at datastreamh2o. Um, subscribe to our newsletter, also a great way to keep in touch. Uh, you can do that at the bottom of any of our sites um, or through this link. You can also email us at datastream at gordonfn.org or uh, my email address, which I'm going to just throw up in the chat. It's patrick at gordonfn.org. Um, and finally, uh, if you want to talk to us in person, uh, we do have our open office hours, first Wednesday of every month from 12 to 1 Eastern with our next one coming up on November 4th. 
You can register for those as well on any of the hub sites. Scroll down to the bottom. There's a link for office hours. Click on that and it'll walk you through. So thanks again, everybody, for coming. Um, great to see that we've got a bunch of new faces. I hope to get a chance to kind of meet with some of you guys one-on-one -on -one and help get you on the data stream. And we're happy to answer any questions anytime that you have. So please feel free to reach out. We're here to help you guys get your data online and make this process as easy as possible. Okay, thanks again. And uh, yeah, we'll be hearing from you soon, hopefully.